All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Slow Art Friday. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum, and I'm joined by Hank Bovey, one of our wonderful touring docents, who is here to lead today's conversation. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection, or in this case, one of our special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's conversation, Hank will lead us in an interactive discussion about three artworks in our current special exhibition, Vantage Points, Contemporary Photography from the Whitney Museum of American Art. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each one. Hank will allow us time to look at each work on our own, slowly, before leading a conversation about each photograph with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Hank, myself, and each other throughout the hour. So a few notes before we get started. You probably noticed that your microphones and video were muted by default as you were getting logged in. We welcome and encourage you to turn on your video at any time so that we can have a conversation with talking heads instead of pictures or names. Um, and I'll make it in just a moment so that you can unmute your microphone as well. For best experience, choose a quiet room and close the door. Please do silence any alerts from nearby devices as they can be quite distracting during the conversation. If you do turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong source of light or movement as it makes it hard to see you. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. While you can log on using a smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet in order to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name so that we know who we're having a conversation with this morning. In order to ask questions or make comments, there are three ways. You can just jump right in, unmute your microphone when Hank uh, or I ask for questions or comments. That's the easiest and most effective way. You can also type any questions or comments that you have into the chat box. Our third way is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar and Hank or I will call on you and unmute your microphone. This is usually the hardest way to get a word in, so please do just feel free to unmute your microphone and jump right in. Finally, we are recording. If you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments that you might have. At this point, I'm going to make it so that folks can unmute uh, their microphones. Please do leave your microphone muted unless you're actively asking a question or making a comment. Before we get started, does anyone have any questions? All right, Hank, what will we be talking about today? Hey, good morning, everybody. As Chrissy said, I am Hank Bovey, and today we're looking at three photographs from the Vantage Points exhibition at the Asheville Art Museum. And for those of you that are regular uh, Slow Art Friday um, attendees, and I see some of you here, you're probably thinking, wow, this is like the third Vantage Points exhibit that we've talked about. And I think that's because it's an excellent, excellent exhibition. And if you get a chance to get to the museum, I highly recommend it. Um, the Vantage Points is a collection of selection of photographic works from the 1970s through the mid 2000s, and they highlight how photography has been used to represent individuals, places, and narratives. And this exhibition is drawn from the Whitney Museum in New York City's permanent collection. The reason I chose Vantage Points um, and, and the three works that we're going to look at today is it's kind of a personal one. I actually have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography. However, um, when I graduated, I was not willing to become a starving artist. So I ended up making my living in another way. And my senior portfolio was all portraiture. And that's what we're looking at today is three portraits of three different artists by three different artists that all were in the New York City area and kind of back in back in the heyday of the uh, 70s and 80s. Um, so we're probably going to spend a fair amount of time not just talking about the images, but about the artists as well um, today. So that might be a little bit different than some of the things we've done in the past. So as Chrissy said, we're going to look at an image. I'll give you a few moments to kind of look at it. Then I'm going to ask you some questions and we'll talk about it. There are no wrong answers. It's really just about what you see in the, in the work. And also, as Chrissy said, 
Um, if you have a comment, question, whatever, just jump in there. You can use the chat box. I'm going to be very honest and tell you that I get so involved in the discussion, I kind of don't look at the chat box. So I might be slow responding, but, but Christy will back me up on that, that I encourage you just to jump in there with whatever your, your comment or question is. So with that said, Christy, let's go ahead and flip to the first slide, please. And take a few moments to look at this, and then we will talk about it. Okay, the question I always begin with, for those of you that are familiar with, with our Slow Art Fridays, is what's going on in this artwork? So what's going on here? It looks to me to be a woman lying down and I, it looks maybe on a bed and she seems to be um, contemplating that, that she's lying back either thinking or reminiscing or um, just, and especially the way her arms are positioned under her head. I don't think she's looking at something up on a ceiling. I, I just think that she's in contemplation mode. So just kind of a, kind of lying there deep in thought. Um, okay, good observation. And what else can we see? I, I see a woman who's who's not only contemplating perhaps, but seems very relaxed. It doesn't seem she doesn't portray any angst to me. Um, whatever she's thinking about is appearing pleasant for her. So no angst there. And what do you see that kind of makes you say that? Um, I guess it's what I see in terms of her face. Um, her mouth is kind of straight across. Her eyes um, are partially closed. Um, she's providing a pillow with her arms for her comfort. Um, so just the facial expression, the position of her arms is, is kind of a relaxed posture. Um, what else can we see in this? Go ahead. Um, and, and in I think, yes, I think, I think that she's in a very, she's um, very wide open, uh, vulnerable type of posture. And, um, while she may be contemplating something, I also think perhaps she may be looking at a partner or looking at someone. I was I going to she's say resting and she's resting and it seems to me posing at the same time. It's not a casual snapshot and um, her facial expression um, kind of indicates to me the possibility that she is posing for a professional photo, photo opportunity. I think she might be looking at something that's maybe there's a window or maybe there is a photograph or a, even a painting that is up on an unseen wall that she may be staring at and contemplating it. <clears throat> so interesting, we've got a couple of things going on here is, is some folks think this is more contemplated, let's say almost a candid shot, that she's just lying there relaxed, whereas um, Karen kind of thinks it's more of a pose, formal portrait type type photograph. So good observations. What else can we see? Well, the rest of her torso and her legs are really kind of left to our imagination or interpretation. Is you, you don't know if her legs are crossed or folded or if her knees are brought up higher. And so you really can't tell that. But I'm also, the gray scales with the coloring and lighting is very intriguing because she is got dark hair and, you know, dark eyebrows and very, looks to be like a, a dark, it could be a red, but a dark, vibrant shirt. And yet the, the gray tones of the um, blanket and the wall that there's nothing else distracting there, that, that she's just there. So, so interesting observation, as you said, the wall, um, there's nothing there. It's pretty much the surface she's lying on and her. I mean, that's the photograph, but yet the artist or the photographer has used, you know, the grayscale, the, the darkness of her hair, and then the, 
slightly different color of her shirt as opposed to that lighter wall to create a lot of interest, despite the fact that in the background there's nothing going on. So good observations, definitely. What else can we see? Hey, Gussie, a young and thoughtful Anne Bancroft. Not sure why, but it just reminds <laughs> me of Anne Bancroft. So similar look to Anne Bancroft, just the facial features or whatever. And then Micah G in the chat says, critical thinking, contemplative, professional portrait. So she's kind of thinking along the same lines as Karen. It looks more, more posed, I'm, I'm going to guess, than, than it does those folks that think it's a candid. So um, back to Tim's comment about it reminded, reminds him of, of Anne Bancroft. Does anybody know who this is? Susan Sontag. Exactly, it's Susan Sontag. Mm -hmm. What can anyone tell me about Susan Sontag? How old was she when this paint, when this photograph was done? Um, this was done in 1975. I think she was born in the mid 30s, so uh, 40-ish. Okay, because I know she's passed away now. Yeah. So, What's kind of interesting, and just to give you um, a little bit on Susan Sontag, and right, she, I got a little short video. Um, she is, you know, for all the simplicity of this photograph, she is a very complex person. Um, and for all the, the sort of peacefulness, calmness, someone said, you know, that she looked at peace, her, she, you know, she wasn't frowning. She was actually a very, um, I don't want to say non-peaceful person, but very involved, very much a political activist, um, you know, a philosopher, a writer. Um, she kind of ran with a wild crowd in New York City kind of thing. So I think that's an, an interesting contrast um, between what the photograph shows us as being a very simple, at-peace person, which might or might not represent Susan Sontag. So anybody have any comments on that? This is Micah. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to say that um, I've done some photography and portraiture and to me, I'm imagining the photographer just saying, you know, be where you are right now in this moment, even though it's a professional portrait, I think. It's also capturing her in that moment authentically. <clears throat> so... It's, a, it's an authentic photo. The photographer basically was like, um, be yourself for this photograph, even though it-, it Be yourself in this moment. Yeah, exactly. So, so that kind of brings another, another point that, of discussion is, you know, in portraiture, what do you think the artist or the photographer, what are they trying to do when they do a portrait, say, of someone like Susan Sontag? Karen, I think your lips are moving, but I think you're muted. It would be frontal. Um, the um, artist facing the, the photographer facing the person. Uh, this is an unusual kind of perspective, I think, in photography. I mean, we have reclining noobs and things like that, <laughs> photos like that. But this is it's different, definitely. <laughs> So a different pose, and, and yeah. even the, the photographer might be trying to show us a, a side of Susan Sontag that the public doesn't necessarily see. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Seems to be very much, now that you mentioned it, a photo uh, of the times. That was very typical. I, I've played around with photography over the years, too. Um, of the candid po uh, photographs, during the 70s and using almost a monochromatic background. Mm -hmm. Right, which obviously the, the monochromatic background is, is um, very much a feature of this photograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anybody else see anything? Uh, Christy, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. 
And as we said, Susan Sontag, uh, the artist is Peter M. Uger, Uger, 1975. And um, just to give you a little insight into the photographer, he was born in 1934, Trenton, New Jersey, same place I was born, although by my accent, you probably wouldn't know that. Um, <laughs> and just a little blurb I read about him from the uh, Morgan Museum and Library of New York City. It, the life and art of Peter were rooted in downtown New York, private by nature, combative in manner, well-read, widely connected. He inhabited a world of avant-garde dance, music, art, and drag performance. His mature career paralleled the public unfolding of gay life between the Stonewall Uprising in 1969 and the AIDS crisis of 1980. So like I said, back in New York's heyday, so to speak, he actually was at Stonewall during the riots and he did die of AIDS-related pneumonia in the 1980s. Um, but what he talks about his photography is, he calls it uncomplicated direct photographs of complicated and difficult subjects. And I think that very much fits the <laughs> better on this one, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. And he's very much known for his um, tending of, to sumptuous black simmering grays, which I think that was mentioned in this one as well. A couple of the artists or photographers that influenced him were Richard Avedon and Diane Arbitz. And you can kind of mm -hmm. see some of that in, in even just this one photograph of his. And then we're going to look at a couple of other artists today, Robert Malthorpe and Dan Golden, who were influenced by, by this photographer. So, um, and one thing that I thought also was said about him is, um, and I'll just give you a little blur of historic crossroads of high art and low life. So he would take these people, I don't want to call them low lives, but you know, people that were famous maybe in a notorious sort of way and then made them into high art. Uh -huh. so with that, we're going to watch a little short film just to give you a little bit of a, um, a feel for Susan Sontag. So Chrissy, if you would go ahead. And did you fulfill all your desires? Certainly not. One of the country's most controversial writers and social she critics... She was the relentless campaigner for human rights and against war. The most intelligent woman in America. Critic, activist, playwright, essayist. She wrote 17 books and won major awards, including the National Book Award. She had relationships with women, and she had relationships with men, and she fell in love with women, and she fell in love with men. When I turned 40, I was in China. When I turned 50, I was in France. When I turned 60, I was in Sarajevo and the bombs were falling. There's a certain kind of person who likes to put themselves in extreme situations because they feel life is to live more fully there. And Susan was one of those people. I guess I go to war because I think it's my duty to be in as much contact with reality as I can be. And war is a tremendous reality in our world. The writer was supposed to be there on the front lines. The writer was supposed to stand for something. What I love, what draws me very much to writing, is it's a way of paying attention to the world. You're just an instrument for tuning into as much reality as you can. For the last hundred years in our society, the most interesting writers have mostly been critics of the society. I like that position. I like the position of being able to express uh, dissenting opinions. <laughs> I know, interesting person. I encourage you to read up on her if you're not familiar with her. Before you move on, I'm going to say one more thing you, you might have noticed in the film. They flashed a photo of one of her books called On Photography, which was, I think, 1977. And then one thing she said, and in that book, it was a, a book of essays, an exploration of photographs, and mainly photographs of, of, taken by tourists and travelers. And one thing she said about it I thought was kind of interesting. She said, the method especially appeals to people handicapped 
by a ruthless work ethic, Germans, Japanese, and Americans. <laughs> Using a camera appeases the anxiety which the work-driven feel about not working when they are on vacation and supposed to be having fun. <laughs> it's something to do that is a friendly imitation of work. They can take pictures. It's kind of interesting how she looked at tourists. Um, and Micah calls her a she-ro, and I can't disagree with you at all on that one, Micah. Very good. So any last um, observations, questions before we move on? All right, Christy, if you would put the next image up there and um, take a few minutes to look at it, and then we will talk about it. Okay, so what's going on in this artwork? I have to say, I was intrigued by the symbol on the pillow. And I looked <laughs> at this before online and I zoomed in on it and I saw that it says McLean Hospital. And I didn't know that, I wasn't familiar with it, so I looked it up. So do you want me to say what it is? What McLean Go right ahead, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a renowned psychiatric hospital up in um, Boston or in Massachusetts in any case. So oh, yeah. the cross and the pillow. So it that's where she is, I assume, right now in, in that psychiatric hospital. So, so good observation. I, I like your detective work. Um, <laughs> that's, you know, that's part of the, the photographer said this is actually a self-portrait, whereas the last one was a portrait. And, it, and, you know, usually we save the title for after our discussion, but I'll go ahead and share with you. The title is Self-Portrait with Milagro, The Lodge, Belmont, Massachusetts. So McLean Hospital, where the pillowcase is embossed with, is in Belmont. She's calling it The Lodge. <laughs> um, in the title, we see the word um, Milagro, and that is actually Spanish for miracle. And milagros, or tiny miracles, are small religious charms that have been used in Mexico and other areas of Latin America for hundreds of years to petition saints for guidance, help, and protection. So now that we've got a few little clues, what else do you think is going on in this photograph? I'm curious, um, is the milagro permanent or did she put it up there? Don't know. Because now if you look at it, there is, it looks like it was hung on the wall. It could be put, she could have put it up there. It could be temporary. It could be. I don't know if McLean Hospital is a, say, religiously affiliated hospital mm -hmm. or not. That, that was going to be my question. What kind, what uh, affiliation? Interesting also the pillow, the pillowcase is upside down. Laurel, when you looked up McLean Hospital, did you get a sense that it was re uh, religiously affiliated or? No, it's not. It's not religiously affiliated. Yeah, I, didn't, not, get Karen. A, I didn't get a sense either way, you know, just that it was um, renowned for what they did and um, that it was affiliated with Harvard Medical and um, that a lot of famous people went there and that's that's what it said but i think the positioning too of her neck and head and her hand are very interesting the way she's kind of propped up there on the bed and uh the, the way her chin and uh head is positioned so so when you say that positioning of, of her whole her head neck, the way she's got her chest and her arm kind of behind her what do you think is happening there I think it's opposing for the camera or you know oh. uh, in that way but she seems to be well um well groomed i mean her her hair and she has lipstick on and some maybe some sort of eye makeup so uh i i can't tell what she's looking at or thinking exactly so it is it is kind of hard to tell well, what else can we see in this photograph I noticed that the bed is pushed all the way in the corner. So 
you have like a barrier behind you and a barrier the whole length of your body, which to me, just imagining what that would feel like, would feel like really being uh, constrained. Um, I also notice I have a feeling that she does not want to get up. She does not have a posture. She does lean forward, but where her left arm is and her right hand, we don't see. It's not a position that you would use to get up from a bed that has, I see, a raised head part. So she is present and she is not ready to get up. So, yeah. okay, I like some good observations there. The fact that she's bordered on two sides by a wall, so she's sort of inside of an enclosure almost, and the fact that from you, what you see, she's not trying to get up and get out. She's maybe is just posing for the camera. What I see, I, it, excuse me. Um, go ahead. All right. Um, what I see both by her pose, her looking at the camera and her lipstick um, and the, the quietness of the background is notice me, um, I'm here. Um, kind of a, a declaration position, it looks like to me. So sort of a here I, I am, kind of, yeah. Go ahead, Evelyn. I, re I originally uh, thought the same thing as Carol, but she has what we call a, a rather flat affect. In other words, there's, there's not any smiling or very, but her eyes to me are sad. And uh, while it's a little bit of a, an aggressive pose, her her actual affect is sort of emotionless, except for her eyes. But that's how I see her. Well, and she's left her Go ahead, Sandy. Well, and she's left herself kind of out of focus. Like she's blurry, maybe not, you know, not Important. feeling completely whole. Well, mm -hmm. And a, a comment or Sally mentioned that too in the comments that are even though her hand is in focus, she's oh, yeah. not, her face is not in focus. The yeah. pillow is. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what's in focus and what's not in focus because you sort of told us at the top of the program that these were three portraits. And I think that when you think of what a portrait is, it's the person is going to be in focus. It's going to be a representation of them and sort of everything in this photograph is in focus except for her. If so, she's the star, why isn't she in focus? And so it, you think then, well, then that's some sort of commentary or it's um, intentional on the part of the artist um, to, to leave the person out of focus. And I wonder if, if like you all have said, this is um, sort of a large uh, psychiatric hospital, If is that how, people feel, you know, if they're being medicated or do they feel like sort of a loss of their personhood, you know, when they're in an institution like that? Is this a self-portrait or well, is it being done by somebody else? Because the other thing that I was thinking is that it could be a depth of field issue. So and maybe done deliberately and done deliberately. Yep, yep. The, I'm going to jump back to Ellen's comment um, only because that was, I think that's significant. She asked <laughs> if this was a portrait or a self-portrait. The last picture of Susan Sontag was a portrait. This is a self-portrait. So there's some things to think about there in, in a, a photographer doing a portrait of someone else versus doing a self-portrait. Do they have a different intent there? And um, also, it's the kind of what what kind of camera was used then to do that portrait. I think so, this was the eighties. Uh, Nineteen eighty-eight. Eighty-eight. Well, they certainly didn't have iPhones then. We were doing selfies. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it predates digital photography. You're exactly right. Well, she could have had a tripod and a camera and timed it. Yes, exactly. I think it's a time. Yeah. But then would she have done it deliberately to have 
put herself out of focus or was it just one of these accidents and she ended up liking it? It's deliberate. I think it's deliberate. I, th I think it's deliberate. I do as well. Maybe she felt her life was out of focus exactly. at that point. So then she set the camera yeah. to do it this way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I could go, I could agree on that. Plus, I noticed she's wearing black. I mean, she's, uh, her skin tones are nice. She has red lipstick. She looks like red hair, but yet she's wearing black. And then I'm assuming for safety precaution reasons, maybe there, she's not wearing a scarf or a necklace or earrings or, or any jewelry or anything, I guess it could be used to harm herself. I don't know the situation in, in the hospital there. It does and, have a ring on her the hand that's visible. Ah, Let me okay. uh, zoom for you, Laura. Okay. And that's a left hand. So she was married. Very interesting. Okay. It looks like a wedding band. So if she had a set of timer, I know, I mean, I have a camera where it has a little, almost like a little remote. So I can, um, when I'm everyone's positioned, like for a group photo, let's say, I could just click it and then it'll go three seconds and take the picture. But back in 1988, I'm wondering if she didn't have to set it and then hurry herself back to sit on the bed in that quick position before the camera took the photograph. So, so could be, and that kind of explains the positioning that you mentioned a, a few moments ago, as far as how she sort of her chest and her arm is maybe she was rushing to to get in place. Although you can have a thirty second timer with a tripod. So a couple of things in the chat that, I, that before we get too carried away, I want to mention is, um, so Hillary uh, mentions that McLean, the hospital is part of the um, giant Massachusetts Brigham Hospital system. And of interest to in those of us in North Carolina, James Tyler was a patient there at one point. Um, and then she also mentions that, and I think someone else mentioned this, that she is, you know, she's fully made up, got her lipstick on and everything. And she, um, Hillary also is, back to our discussion of the focus. She likes that notion that the self photographer intentionally made herself out of focus, you know? So I think that kind of puts a different spin on it when she says she intentionally made herself out of focus. So what is the focus? Ross. Exactly, what do you think for, or for you sitting there, you know, since she's possibly decided that she did not want to be the focus what would you say is the focus? For me, this is Micah. I, I was immediately drawn to the to the image on the pillowcase. And I think without that, it would be a completely different photograph, knowing what it what it is. Yeah, agreed. Yep, well, I, I have to focus on the cross right away. So, so do I. Um, I have to believe that it's a um, Christian oriented or a Catholic uh, hospital. So it could be, but also yeah. remember the title is 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 um, Milagro the Lodge, so or self portrait with Milagro. So uh -huh. remember, Milagro is a um, a religious charm that's used to petition saints for miracles. She uh -huh. could have put that up herself because uh -huh. you can see the there's a nail on top, and that's uh -huh. one thing I thought of before. It could be temporary as opposed to a permanent. Yeah, yeah it looks, it looks like, like a thumbtack. Thumb yeah, like <laughs> I said that at the same it's time. So <laughs> good. <James>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she could have put it up, and she could have done it deliberately. The mm -hmm. whole maybe this whole portrait is um, very well planned out. Mm -hmm. and, that, and actually the focus is on the cross. And also, the, as I said before, the pillowcase is upside down. So it takes a while to figure out it's McLean. Mm -hmm. I think there is a great contrast between the carefully applied makeup, the eyebrows, the eye mascara and the lipstick and the emotions that her face expresses. So, um, I don't know, because I could think about why she put the makeup on to pose for this picture. Was she starting to feel better? Was she, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell a lot of different possibilities, but this contradiction is so striking in the 
sadness and lack, lack of expression in her face, except her eyes. So, so do you, there's a big a contradiction for you there with the fact she's got she's fully made up, but even though she's in you know a, um, a mental health facility, she's fully made up. But as you mentioned earlier, her face just is so expressionless, other than the sad eyes. So, and then if you tie that to the emblem on the pillow, the cross on the wall, um seems like there's probably a whole story going on here. Yeah. Could she have just arrived or could she just be getting ready to leave? Is this the beginning or the end of her stay there? So good question, because if we look at her, her posture, does that help you decide if she's coming or going? Mm. Getting up. She's Getting caught. Up. She's caught in between. She yes, could go either I way. Or she might be about to be discharged, and um, and she's nervous about it. She says that she's not ready to be discharged. So it, it, it kind of she's worried about taking that leap back to to life yeah. outside yeah. of the institution. Uncertainty of the outside world. Yeah, could be. Could and be. Especially she's she's wearing almost in a way outside clothes. Yeah. Good, good observation. Yes, her her outfit is um, impatient looking. I think I think she's an impatient. I uh, taught psychiatric nursing and worked on inpatient <laughs> units, and you don't want people in anything but their own clothes. You want them to be made up. You don't want you want they we don't want them to have the hospital sick illness. Thing. You want them to be as functioning as possible. So I'm not sure we can say because she's got her lipstick on and her and is dressed that she's ready to go anywhere. Uh -huh. um, you, you just always encourage them to be groomed. You have they have their own clothes. Uh, there are restrictions for safety. So I'm not sure we can make that assumption personally. So, Anna Neal, do you feel yes. like the fact that she's wearing her some jewelry, you know, her ring, does that make you? The ring would be fine. I think you would be careful with uh, necklaces. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm having a problem here. I'm going to have to stop for a little bit, but I, that um, I kind of really enjoy the information that. Uh, that Annie just shared with us as far mm -hmm. as in this situation, she might be encouraged to wear the makeup, the street clothes, regardless of whether she's coming and going, you know, and may, that may also be possibly why she's out of focus, you know, or has put herself out of focus. Let me piggyback on to what Anna Neal said, just that I was a psychiatric social worker. Um, and I'm familiar with McLean having had a number of my clients who who spent time there, um, and and I agree with what Anna Neal said. You you want people to to be a part of life, and that means getting up and getting dressed and going through the activities it takes. Um, so I agree that it's not a clue about has she just arrived or is she just going. Um, and uh, keeping a wedding ring on would have been perfectly appropriate, I think. So. Carol, um, Hillary made a really good, uh, had a really good question over in the chat box, which was, um, do you feel like your experience with um, McLean or uh, those sorts of environments was the same now as it is the same now as it might have been in the late 80s when this photograph was taken? Um. Just purely out of curiosity yeah, um, to see, you know, you know what I, we can learn by dating the photograph. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it was in terms of, of being in the, um, being dressed and, and being in groups, which is one of the main treatments along with medication. Um, her apparel, I think, would have been as apropos in 88 as it would have been 20 years later. So, so you think that probably in 1988, it was pretty much the same. 
would have been the same situation as far as her being encouraged to wear her street clothes, put on some makeup, fix her hair, that kind of thing. Yeah. So you're saying that, well, we're coming to the conclusion that this could be at any time. It could be she's arrived, she's in as an inpatient in the midst of, or she could even be getting ready to leave. I don't think her clothing gives a clue as to where she's yeah, at in the guess, treatment yeah, process. Like, so yes, yeah, Ellen, saying. what you're saying, I agree with. The color right. photograph, but it's very interesting that all the colors are in the um, more muted tones or the beiges, browns, whites, uh, duller whites, blacks. And the real color is in her lips and the highlighted part of her reddish hair. Yes, the only color is, is you're right, her lips, her hair, and then everything else is just got on a black top. Everything else is beige, browns, sort of dull colors. And Hillary mentioned earlier that her eyebrows and down to her mouth have the same arc. And that also contributes to that sad look that she has. Her look, look it looks very deliberate. Like she, was made, she, she made herself up to look the way she did deliberately. Well, and I'll share something with you all on that is, is when I was doing research on her, this, the artist is Nan Gold, and when I was doing research on Nan, I, um, this was 1988, I, I saw some more current photos of her and I saw an interview with her on, um, in a video and she was wearing that exact same lipstick. She still has the red hair and she, everything I saw, she was wearing a black dress or top or whatever. So that must be her style. So even today, she doesn't look a whole lot different. So um, and just to give you a little bit of information on Nan, she was born in 1953 in Washington, D.C. Um, she got her Bachelor of Fine Arts from Tufts University in 77. And she moved to New York and worked a lot in the downtown new wave scene. She did a lot of slideshows with music at punk rock concerts. She did a big series in the 80s, up through 80 through 86, called The Bout of Sexual Dependency. And that series did a lot of snapshot style photographs of couples, either in amorous or abusive situations. Sometimes it was of her. Um, she, she was, as, as we see here in rehab for drugs in the, um, in the 80s. So a lot of her subjects were in similar situations. And on kind of a sad note, a lot of folks that were in the series of the bout of sexual dependency um, have since passed away because of the, the lifestyle is kind of detrimental to your health. Um, she has moved on away from that. She still features herself in a lot of photographs, but now she does a lot of representations of um, family, her kids. Um, and she's current in 1994, she published a uh, Tokyo Love, a series where she collaborated with a Japanese photographer. Well, Black is Dura Gerfin, uh, the New York downtown scene. I'm sorry, what was that? Black is Dura Gur for the New York downtown scene. Everybody wears black. <laughs> exactly. And like I said, from what I can see to this day, she still wears black. So All of us at the museum wear black too, <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> it's like requirement. Do you want to work here? Do you have black in your closet? <laughs> the docents bring all the color into the staff. <laughs> Color was uh, and it is an accessory. <laughs> there you go. That you know, I when I saw this the first time when the museum got the exhibition home, and we did training, and I thought I got to use that in a slow art Friday. So you all may be glad I did. <laughs> so, any last comments or questions before we go on to the next it's, one? It's uh, now that we have looked at it um, for some time. It's such a startling contrast to the first one of Susan Sontag, where the colors were kind of all blended and here she really, she jumps right out at me. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is and another reason I kind of chose this one and put it in the middle of what you'll see next. So let's go ahead and move on.
<laughs> so what do y'all think is going on in this artwork? <laughs> I know who that is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should I say or hold back? So let's, let's just describe first, Micah Jean. Okay. Picking up black clothing, it almost makes him disappear. It's like a hand, mm -hmm. a walking cane, and a head. But you don't see the black sweater at first. It's almost like his head is there, just, just floating. And uh, yeah. I think the hair is interesting, the lighting on the hair. And um, his eyes obviously are looking straight forward. This is a straight on picture, as well as the little skull with the walking stick straight on as opposed to the other two women that were positioned very differently. This is just straight with the ears, the eyes and. So a lot of good stuff here. The fact that he's wearing this black shirt. So he's just a, a floating head in the hand. He's very direct right in front of the camera. He's yeah. not posed or reclining or we're not sure of how he's sitting. He's just right there in front of us. So yes, good observations. What else? He is very, very deliberate. Here I am, here I am. Both his facial expression, his, uh, his eyes intense, reaching towards the photographer and then the way his hand clasps the uh, staff. Yeah, he's very much yeah, I am. Yeah, it's uh, to me. Well, it's very deliberate. Looks very, very posed. I mean, everything he did, putting on the black sweater, making sure it blends into the background. It's it's very and are deliberate and artistic. At least yes. to me, I'm right. st I'm struck by his eyes and then the eyes of the head, um, the <laughs> skull on top of the walking yeah. stick as well as by how, um, how angular his chin is. And again, yeah. that feels like it's mimicked in the head on the walking stick to me. Um, so the similarities just between some of their facial features, even though the one has no hair and no skin or ears. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we talked a lot in the previous photograph about the depth of field and the really intentional focus. And I know that on my screen, I see things a little bit more sharply than everybody else. Um, but it's, it's the same here um, where his hand and the walking stick and the carved skull are in super sharp focus. And he is not in as sharp a focus. He's not as blurred as the previous photograph, but he is definitely not what was focused on for this portrait again. It's like a soft focus because he's, he's Mm, sort of behind that, the walking stick and hand that are the sharp focus. But this, something funny struck me. There's that one strand of hair into his forehead. Let me see if I can zoom on that. It, it's like right in the middle, pointing <laughs> right towards the eye. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then look in front of his ear, like even <laughs> in front of the his right ear, like there's a strand there. Yeah. Right. That looks almost like something is, is, is hanging, almost like an ear yeah. piece or something. And then, but in, on the left ear, it's like that. Oh, his hair is long. So when I uh, zoom in, can you guys see that a little bit more? Sort yeah. of the mm -hmm. extreme difference in the focus between uh -huh. this and his face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this is is this a self portrait? It is. I mean, I know who it is. I mean, it looks like him, is it? So it is, and that's um, I don't know that kind of review what we've talked about. Um, it is a self-portrait, as Christy mentioned. You know, the skull and the hand are very sharp focus. The subject's face is a lot softer focus. Um, so interesting in that mm -hmm. the first photograph we looked at today was a portrait of someone else in perfect focus. This is the second self-portrait that we've seen where the actual person is not in focus. 
the lack of focus also makes him look soft. You know, like his hair looks very soft yeah. and uh, even the, the, the texture of his skin, whereas the um, walking stick, I, I don't know if it's wood or metal, it, it's hard to tell, um, but that is uh, definitely, okay, not a s soft, you wouldn't expect that to be soft to the touch, yet his hair would be. So the hair, yeah, the hair is nice and soft, but um, in the comments, um, well, Hillary says she loves the photo, the lighting. Um, Micah Jean asked the question, why the skull? And I'm going to expand on her question and go, why is the skull in sharp focus? I think it could represent the darker side of him. He's looking out at you in a very honest way even though it is out of focus, but that skull is up front and maybe that represents a darker side to his personality. So the skull, which yeah, is kind of a, a dark side image. <laughs> yeah. That might be his intent here. Well, well knowing, he, knowing that he's dying and he has this evil skull, to me, his eyes also look like they're terrorized, like death is coming, and he may not be happy about it. So the skull could represent death. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it does represent death, and I, I think this is an incredibly powerful photograph, and I won't say who this is because I know who it is, but... Um, it, he's, it's so in the moment, he's so present, and yet with the darkening around him, it's suggesting to me that he's fading, that he's so, starting to disappear. He knows he's starting to disappear, and what he's grabbing is telling you, this is why I'm disappearing, but I'm fully here right now. And there's also signs of age, Micah Jean. Um, his forehead is pretty, uh, is, is getting lined. Um, he's lost some of the sharpness in his face. There's gray streaks in his hair as well. So, um, you know, he could be contemplating his mortality as he ages, which, you know, I think that in the history of art, including a skull and a painting is often um, sort of a reminder to people to that time is short, we are all going to die. Make sure that you live your life to the fullest. Yeah. It's sort of one of those symbols, you know, for hundreds of years found in paintings, yeah. um, reminding us of our own mortality. Makes me think of Day of the Dead and Mexican art, the skulls. Yeah. Yeah, that is a common theme in, in Mexican art. Um, and Kenneth mentioned in the chat, you know, that. Um, this photograph might represent his own mortality. So I think that's good. Yeah. Um, any, anything else that we see here? I find it interesting that the piece of hair that comes down the right side, uh, his right ear is black and there's a black patch right above it. And um, that might indicate that he wanted to um, keep some of his useful look by um, applying some black hair color. Mm -hmm. I notice there's some above the left ear too. Mm -hmm. But there's something about on the right side, it's almost, it almost looks artificial as if it's, that is not hair compared to how the rest of his hair is. It's almost as if he has like a string there. Can or a we piece of hair that? that he's been playing with. You know how when you, sort of yeah. twist a piece of hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this little one that just keeps pulling out. Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, but you know that it, because you're touching it with your hands, it'll get a little greasy and sort of look a little different. Maybe it's a nervous habit for him. So it could be that it's, yeah, it's that way because he's been twirling it like you do when you're I, I think it's an artistic touch that, that he favored. <laughs> a, a little flair, huh? So, um, 
Just to kind of summarize this photograph and give you some real good clues on it, this is a self-portrait of Robert Mapplethorpe. Um, he actually did this picture in 1988. He died a year later of age-related complications. So as Micah mentioned in the chat, he knew at this point that he was um, probably terminal. So I think we kind of hit the nail on the head with some possible interpretations as far as you know, he, he realizes he's fading. He's got that death symbol in the foreground. So um, a lot of good stuff there. So we're going to look at a quick video again, only because I want to put this video in because when we first put this one up here, you know, some people were snickering because Robert Mapplethorpe, I think for most of us, we remember him for his very, his photographs that had a lot of them. Um, homoeroticism, a lot of uh, sadomasochistic images and, and sexually um, sexual undertones. But he actually was a very diverse photographer. You know, that was just a small piece of who he was. So as I started, you know, reading about him to get ready for today, I was looking at all these other images that, that I had forgotten about. So I thought it'd be nice to, to take a look at some of that. So Christy, if you would, let's go ahead and then look at the video real quick. <laughs> Robert Maplethorpe, who spent the last years of his life promoting homosexuality. Now, any senator who thinks that I'm attacking aesthetic art. If they have any doubt, and look at the pictures, look at the pictures, look at the pictures. He loved to get a jolt out of people, a reaction. It was power. Just the way he dressed, the way he carried himself. The artist encompassed him. I always was fascinated with the idea of taking sexuality and bringing it to a level that it hadn't been to before. There was tension. My father wouldn't look at Robert. He was really not part of the family. He was so busy being Robert Maplethorpe to really care. Everything was the means to an end to his career. He was a new type of art. The whole point of being an artist is to learn about yourself. The photographs, I think, are less important than the life that one is leading. <laughs> So I think you saw some of those images of flowers and the portraits he did. He was an exceptional photographer. I just want to share that when I was living in, this is Micah, when I was living in Berkeley, California, the, the university had an exhibit of his work. I think it was the um, early 80s, maybe 80 three or 84, and I had never known his work. And I went into that exhibit and was completely blown away by, his, as you said, Hank, the diversity of his photography. I, I was just, and I remember stepping out into the daylight with my friends and I said, that's what I wanna do. I wanna do black and white photography and it completely changed my life, so. Mm -hmm. so uh, <laughs> thanks for that testimony. Wow. <laughs> He is an exceptional black and white photographer. <laughs> and I thought you all might appreciate North Carolina's own Jesse Helms at the beginning mm -hmm. of that. You know? yeah. so, um, <laughs> Jesse Helms. Appreciate is <laughs> the operative <laughs> word there. Uh, quotes around appreciate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so any last comments or questions? Wasn't Mabel Sorb closely affiliated with Patty Smith? Didn't they? Yes. They had a very close relationship. Yes, they were actually yeah. partner, partners in the early days. Yeah, exactly. That's they right. were lovers at one time. And um, so, yeah. Isn't the book Kids about them? Am I making yes. that up? Okay. There's actually a Netflix documentary out there right now on him, too, that's kind of interesting. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so this, um, this one was the trailer for the HBO one, but I believe the HBO also made a film um, about uh, Robert Maplethorpe that some people like and some people don't, um, but he was played by Matt Smith, who I thought did a phenomenal job because he really kind of looks like him. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. 
you can find lots of uh, Maplethorpe movies. He uh, made quite an impression, um, you know, part of the, the culture wars in the 1980s. And, you know, I know pornography when I see it, <laughs> you know, that famous <laughs> line. All right. Anything else, Hank? That's it. I just want to say thank you all so much for another wonderful much. Slow Art Friday discussion. Sure. This photo, this uh, photography exhibition has been amazing for sparking conversations. Um, the photographs are just wonderful. Um, the exhibition is up through March the 15th, so for another month or so, another three, four weeks. So um, please do try and stop by and see the exhibition if you haven't. We have uh, lots of COVID um, safety uh, regulations in place. Uh, the best time to come if you'd like to have the fewest number of people in the museum is sometime during the week. Uh, thank you, Hank. As always, wonderful discussion leader. We appreciate you. Uh, next Friday, uh, the 26th at 12 p.m., our conversation is going to be called The Color Blue, Finding Meaning in You. And our docent, uh, touring docent Megan Pyle has chosen three artworks, uh, two from the museum's collection and one from our special exhibition Across the Atlantic, American Impressionism Through the French Lens, uh, that strongly feature the color blue in order to um, really explore the way that that particular color um, makes us feel. So join us for that if you haven't already signed up. In the meantime, I hope everybody has a really great weekend and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Thank you very much, Christy. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Take care.